Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corley with Figure It Out Productions. The following video is part of our quick shoot series and is intended to aid the Dreamcast and gaming community. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and today we're going to be talking about this. This is the USB GD-ROM. Now, uh, before we go into what this is exactly, uh, I should let you know, first of all, to thank a guy named Chip Sinkbell uh, for hooking me up with this. He's a buddy of mine. He runs my Patreon podcast with me. Basically, if you follow me on Patreon, or support me on Patreon, I should say, uh, you get the podcast early, and if you don't want to, it's totally fine uh, because the podcast gets released monthly publicly. It just comes out like a month later. So what I'm saying is go back, check it out, look at all the episodes, and you'll get to know Chip. He's an awesome dude. We talk about video games and all sorts of stuff on there. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, but anyway, I went to go visit him in Texas uh, last month, oh, last month at the time I make this video, uh, and um, when I got there, he just gave me one of these. I guess he had ordered a few of them, and... Thanks again, Chip, because that's pretty awesome. So if you know what this is, you know that's kind of a crazy thing to give somebody. But uh, if you don't know what it is, I'm going to tell you. So here we have the Sega Dreamcast. You know it, you love it, hopefully. Uh, no, it's up to you if you like it or not. I'm guessing you do, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here. But um, yeah, so you're, imagine the following scenario. You got your Dreamcast, and you want to play some games, but uh-oh, it's not reading the discs. You know, the disc is, you, you try cleaning the disc. You try cleaning the console, cleaning the lens, you know? And you even try tweaking the laser. Nothing. It just won't read discs. So you have a few options at that point. Uh, one, you could throw the console away. Bad idea. Don't do that. Hold on to it for parts. Uh, secondly, you could try and fix the laser assembly. So this is the GD-ROM laser assembly. Um, basically, this is the most common thing to go on a Dreamcast. They break with relative ease, unfortunately. Uh, the laser itself in there can be replaced, however you need serious modification skills to be able to do that. I lack that ability, I can't even really dream of having that ability, but I know it is possible. The alternative is to find an entire GD-ROM unit like this and simply take out the one inside the console and replace it with this one, um, or you know, another unit that's functional. Uh, however, that is not financially practical. Uh, the reason, of course, is, like I said, this is the least uh, reliable part of the console. So as a result, the odds of finding a, dream, a donor Dreamcast that has a good one but had, like, a defective motherboard or something is not that often. Uh, they, so if you, like, check out eBay, you will see them, but often they're more expensive than just buying a whole new console, which is really dumb, but that's the way it is. Um, so the other alternative you have is to get something like this, the USB GD-ROM. Now, obviously, when you look at this thing, it's not going to read discs. This will not play your discs. But what you do is, instead of reinserting this thing, you put this in its place. There's a port here and, of course, on the console, and you stick it in that way. Now, as the name implies, it has USB ports. And you probably know where I'm going with this thing. Uh, or with this at all. It, you connect USB-based devices like uh, flash cards or flash drives um, and or like SD cards with like little flash uh, based readers or even hard drives that are USB based. You plug them in there and then your Dreamcast will read games stored on there. It's essentially a flash card like an EverDrive but you know specifically for the Dreamcast. If the concept sounds familiar it's uh, because something like this for the Dreamcast already exists. It's called the GDMU I did a video on it, I think like two years ago. Um, it's the same thing, except it specifically uses SD cards. Uh, it's a very cool device, but I really wanted to check this one out because a lot of people were talking about it uh, being really good in a lot of different ways. There are certain differences, I'm sure. The most obvious, of course, is that this uses USB, um, which in theory is more convenient. Uh, I would like to note that uh, this is, I believe, the second major iteration of this thing. I'm sure there were little tweaks along the way, but the two major differences is the direction the USB ports face. On this particular board, uh, the USB ports face inward towards the board. So when you have it inside the console, the USB ports are inside the console. Um, as opposed to the original version, the USB ports were faced the other way. The logic with that was that, well, frankly, the inside of the Dreamcast is rather small. You can't fit this and a hard drive inside of it. You just can't. Um, so to do that, to connect a hard drive, it made more sense to have a, an external hard drive face off the back of the console and then just kind of plug into it. Now, if you know the Dreamcast, you know there is no USB port on the back of it. There's no space for one. So what you would have to actually do is cut the plastic to make space to be able to use this thing. When I first saw that, I didn't like that. I thought that was a bad idea, and that's what actually kept me away from it. But this version of the device 
the guy who makes these things actually flipped the USB port so they're facing the inward. Now what that means is that you don't have to cut a hole in the back of the console anymore. But if you want to connect a hard drive, it's not going to fit. So what you have to do is have the lid up on the console and then like an external hard drive there and it just kind of feeds in through. It won't be aesthetically pleasing, but it will work. Um, alternatively, I'm sure more of what the plan was is that, you know, flash drives are getting cheaper and bigger. The entire Dreamcast library can fit about on a, a one terabyte drive and still have some space left over for the upcoming like independent games. And those independent games, they aren't that big. Uh, so realistically, you'll never actually fill the entire thing. Um, so basically, if you had a one terabyte flash drive, you'd be good forever. I mean, that at the time I make this video is not financially practical, but there will come a time where it is. Uh, so that's probably what the intended plan is. Uh, of course, you don't have to do this only if your you know lens is dead. You know, you could have a functional unit, take it out, and put this in instead. Uh, I haven't used this yet, but uh, if it's anything like the uh, GDMU, I'm sure it'll have superior load times. And of course, there is the convenience of you know being able to have all your games in one location. Uh, granted, they're digital, but that also does prevent you from having to you know mess with your collection if you want to do it that way. But um, yeah, before I start thinking about you know pros and cons of this thing, I should really connect it and uh, show it to you guys in action. To begin installation, the first thing we have to do is flip it over to the bottom. You'll see this sticker, or something very similar, I'm sure. This basically says it's NTSCU, meaning it's North American. Uh, the device is region free, so it doesn't matter if it's NTSCU, NTSCJ, or PAL, doesn't matter at all. What matters is this number next to it. You see there's a circle and a number one. If it says that, you're good. If it says it has a circle and a zero inside of it, you're also good. However, if it's a circle with a two in it, that means it's revision two, and this board is not compatible with revision twos. So make sure to check that before you buy this thing. Odds are you have the revision one because that's far and away the most common version. Take the modem off by applying a little bit of pressure. It will re reveal one screw point. There is four in total, one here, there, there, and there. And it just uses a standard Phillips head screwdriver. Once you have your screws out, you're gonna flip the console over like this and you just lift the top off. It's incredibly simple. And you'll see the inside of the Dreamcast. Um, not particularly complicated machine. Uh, so what you gotta do at this point is remove three extra screws. There's one right there, there's one right here, and there's one in the back, kind of back there. You can see that. You have to remove all those. Again, just a standard same Phillips head screwdriver will get it done. Once you have your screws out, we're going to remove the GD assembly. The only source of pressure will be right about here. There's a connection point. Uh, but that's no problem. You just kind of lift up and out it comes. No big deal. Um, now, of course, be very careful. Don't touch the lens because that could damage it, assuming this is a working unit. Um, and in this case, it is. Uh, mine actually works, um, which kind of presents us with our next problem. Uh, so you have your new board and you could just connect it right here and now. Um, alternatively, what you're supposed to do is that you're supposed to take this metal frame and remove it and install it on that board. I'm not gonna do that. The reason I'm not gonna do that is this unit functions. In fact, ironically, I don't have any dead GD or GD ROMs. I only have functional ones. Um, so there's none I want to, you know, basically ruin. And unfortunately, you kind of have to do that in order to get the parts. If you flip it around, you'll see what I'm talking about. There's three screw points right here that you can see, but there's actually two more like buried under this thing, which you would have to basically rip off in order for this thing to um, be accessible. Once you do that, you could take this frame apart and then you would encase it around this board like you're properly supposed to. Since I don't have any dead, you know, uh, dead GD ROMs, I don't want to do that. So you don't, it's not essential to do that. You don't have to do that. You could just install it by connecting it here and just like, you know, play, put, you know, putting enough pressure on this thing and you know, there you go, it's installed. Problem with that is a couple of things. One, there's no, there's nothing other than the port, you know, securing it, which is not, not good. Um, secondly, uh, the Dreamcast was designed, its cooling system was designed to have this there. So the way it, you know, sucks in air and it moves air around is based on that design. This doesn't accomplish that. The metal frame would help, although not solve the problem. The, uh, the GDMU ran into this issue and there's 3D printed molds you can actually put into the console to solve it with that version. With this one, as far as I know, there's no such thing, at least yet. Um, so be aware that with this in, this, uh, in the console, 
especially the way I'm doing it currently, the console will get hotter than it's supposed to, particularly the power supply. So ironically, what you might want to do is play the con you know, play with the, uh, if you're going to do this, keep the console exposed like this and keep your, you know, apartment or house or whatever, the room you're in, keep it air conditioned so that eh, it runs nicer. But, uh, you know, that's up to you. Uh, to properly do this, you would have to put this metal casing on and then probably some sort of 3D printed mold that doesn't currently exist as far as I know. That is a negative. Be aware of that. But, um, yeah, it is technically installed at this point. Um, so I'm going to use it like this and uh, start giving you guys some notes. Okay, so I've been using this thing for quite some time. I actually beat Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 on it again. Powered right through them. It was fucking awesome. Um, just to, you know, get a sense of it. But, uh, no, it was great. Uh, okay, so let me give you my ultimate review on this thing. Um, which is very mixed, if I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Uh, so the first issue is one that admittedly is very much on me, not so much the device, which is that obviously I didn't put the metal shielding part in there, therefore it doesn't sit very well. Again, I know that's on me. Um, if I ever get like a, ironically, if I ever find a broken GDMU, or, or sorry, GD-ROM, I'll replace that, but at the time I, I don't have one. Um, but on top of that, wouldn't solve the heating issue as mentioned before, so... If I was going to use it, and the way I did use it when I was playing is I left it out and exposed like this in a cold room. That way the natural airflow could solve the heating issue. But it didn't have any problems playing the game, so that was fantastic. Um, now, let's talk about uh, when you first get this thing, what you're going to have to do. Uh, using it is very simple. Uh, you take your flash drive or your hard drive, whatever you want to use, and you have to connect that to your computer and you go to a website, I'll put a link to it in the description, it's by the guy who makes this thing. Uh, he also provided all the software you'll need. You basically download a like a root file that uh, opens up, it's just a little rare zip file, I don't remember which one it is actually, uh, but uh, it uh, has, once you get it, it's very small, it has a ton of folders in it, which can look very off-putting, and it also has this just one ISO file. You actually only need that ISO file. You don't actually need the folders. Those are just there for your convenience. Um, what you do is you take the uh, little ISO file and you put it on your flash drive or your hard drive. Um, side note, your flash drive or hard drive must be FAT32 formatted. I realize that's kind of inconvenient, but that's what this thing takes is FAT32. FAT32 is obviously a very old format, um, and a lot of uh, devices, like this is a one terabyte hard drive, Windows won't format that shit to FAT32. It just won't do it. Um, so you have to get uh, bigger, you have to get, I'm sorry, you have to get third-party software that will format um, big devices like this. Uh, so I found that, I got it to work, it was fine. Uh, but once you, that is an annoying extra step you have to take. Uh, but once you get around that and you format the thing to FAT32, you drop the one uh, ISO file in there. Then you can use whatever folder structure you like to put your games in there. Like I said, I didn't like the guy's folder structure, so I made my own. Uh, but you could use his. There's no reason you can't do that. Uh, at that point, you're pretty much ready to rock. You just connect it to the device here, and then you turn it on like you would normally. Um, and what will happen is the Dreamcast will boot up that first file you put on there, which you should always just leave on there. Um, now, what that file basically is is a menu system. And that menu system is both amazing and not so great at the same time. Um, that menu system is super fucking convenient because it um, obviously makes it very easily easy to access all your games because it just shows you the exact layout you created and says, you know, go click on whatever you want, and then you go and find the files and you're good to go. Uh, if you're going to run... Uh, so if you're running like um, independent software or burned versions of software, uh, games will be usually, you know, like whatever the name of the game is, .cdi, and you can just click on that one file and you're good to go. With uh, original, like, you know, uh, Dreamcast releases, like let's say it was Sonic Adventure or something, um, there's the burned versions. You could run that, although it's kind of pointless because a lot of the burned versions were worse because they stripped out a lot of the audio and stuff to make the games fit. So what you want to find is the original GD uh, RIP, which is like a 1.1 gigabyte file, or a series of files, and that's where it gets confusing. Uh, one of the files in there will be called something like disk.gdi. 
So you have to click on that. So like, let's say you have a folder that says, in my case, I had a folder for North America, then inside of that, a folder for S. And then inside of that, you'd see a folder for Sonic Adventure. And then inside of that, you'd see a bunch of files. And one of them is called disk.gdi. That's the one you have to click on to make Sonic Adventure work. Uh, depends on how you choose to organize it. That's how I did it. It's a little inconvenient to get down there, but the alternative is uh, much less convenient. The only thing we can really compare it to is the GDMU. Now, the GDMU did not have a, a menu system at all originally. It does now, although I haven't really used it but uh, it didn't have one originally. So what it would do is it would have a folder called like 01, and that would just represent the first disc. And you could have a bunch of folders in there, and you could put in games in each folder, but you couldn't custom label them. And when you would put it in the Dreamcast, it would just boot up whatever the first one was. And if you decided I didn't want to play that game, there was physically a button on it you would press, and it would tr basically trick the device into switching to the next disc. Um, which was annoying because you never really knew what game was in there unless you memorized the order of it. Uh, so this was more convenient in that sense. However, uh, there are certain benefits to doing it the way the GDMU did, which is, this is going to get a little technical, but I'll try to simplify it here. Basically, the GDMU, as far as the Dreamcast is concerned, is the GD-ROM. It just is and uh, it, the game folder is the disc. So the console is just straight up playing the game. There's nothing special going on as far as it knows. Uh, whereas with this, uh, the, game, the Dreamcast, as far as it knows, is running a game. That's what it thinks the menu is. It thinks the menu is a game. And then that game happens to, part of its code is to tell it to look on this device connected to it and run another game. So in layman's terms, the Dreamcast is running a game to run a game. And because of that extra step, and this was explained to me pretty well last year by someone, um, apologies, I don't remember who, uh, but basically because of that extra step, it creates unintended bugs in the software. Uh, some games will have extra issues that aren't supposed to be there because the, it's not a clean boot, if that makes sense. Um, now personally, I didn't run into this problem. Uh, maybe it's because Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 are, are, you know, not as complicated as they need to be, or maybe I didn't notice, I don't know, but I didn't run into any issues that I, I recall. Um, so, yeah, there's that. But other people on forums and stuff have said there are issues, etc. Now, fortunately, the guy who makes this thing on that same website, uh, he does firmware updates pretty frequently to address bugs and compatibility issues and stuff like that. The firmware updates are super easy to use. Basically, you just download them, you drop them in there like you would, you know, any other file. It's just done. And then once you have it on your flash drive or your hard drive, you turn the Dreamcast on, you'll see the firmware update file as if it was a game. You just click on it, the Dreamcast will load it, and that'll update it. And then there will be bugs patched out of it. It'll be great. Um, but uh, so one of the things that's great about the menu system, though, is that it's region free. Uh, now, what, that was one of the big disadvantages of the GDMU is that the device did not disable region coding. Uh, so if you put it into a North American Dreamcast like this, and then you're like, hey, I'll put a Japanese or a European game in that first folder, the Dreamcast isn't going to do anything with it. Uh, you would have to do it as if it was a real disc. You know, you'd put the first folder would be like Codebreaker, Gameshark, preferably Codebreaker, and then, then the uh, second folder would be the PAL or Japanese game and it would run Codebreaker, and then you would press the button to switch at the right time, and it would uh, switch to the second disc, which is the import disc, and then the Dreamcast could run it. With this, you don't have to do that because it just disables region coding, which is fantastic. But it doesn't allow you to switch discs easily. Uh, like I said with the GDMU, it has that button right on there, no problem. This does not have any such button, and it has like a software solution for this, uh, where you can basically, like, let's say you wanted to use uh, cheats, you want to use Game Shark or something, or if you had a multi-disc game like Shenmue or Resident Evil 2 or something like that, um, with the GDMU that's not that big of a deal because you just press the button when you need to. With the, with this thing, there's a software solution that I could not get to work. Uh, basically, it's the way it's designed is you go into the menu and you find whatever you want to be your second disc. And I guess you press X on it, and then the Dreamcast will know to keep that in mind as the second one. 
and then you go over and you press A on whatever the game is you want to play then and there. Um, and then supposedly all you do at that point is you lift the lid, but because I didn't have it connected, I couldn't get that to work. Um, and also because it's a hard drive, even if I even tried this with the lid on and having the hard drive come out of it like that, it couldn't ever close properly and I would try really hard to get it to close as best I could so I could trick whatever sensor presumably it would be attempting to go for. But I just could never get it to work. I didn't get it to work on flash drives either, even when it could close cleanly. I didn't see why that would work, but that's what I was told to do. Um, so basically what I'm telling you is with the G uh, or the USB GD-ROM, I could not get the disk swapping to work. That is a little problematic for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it makes it harder to do things like cheat codes and stuff. Two, the, the multi-disc games become more inconvenient if you want to play them. Uh, some of them straight up won't work because of this. Like D2 uh, is a four disc horror game for the Dreamcast. And unlike, say, Shenmue and Resident Evil 2 that allow you to save your progress at the end of the disc so that you can just boot up on disc two uh, or disc three or four, whatever the case may be, um, with D2 you can't do that. It just it needs you to go straight from disc to disc to disc without saving, which is kind of insane, but that's what that game did. Uh, so that game is unplayable. Uh, at one point it apparently was software patch to work, and then the later patch undid it for some reason. Probably unintended, but that's what happened. So you can't play D2 on it, at least at the time I make this video. Uh, also, um, yeah, uh, Bleemcast. Bleemcast is another example of disc swapping. And Bleemcast works fine on the GDMU. No problems. Again, because it's a straight boot and because it has that button that allows you to switch discs. This thing will not, not only can it not switch the disc, it actually can't boot Bleemcast at all. Um, and I have to assume that's because it's running through that game to another game type of deal. Bleemcast software was incredibly complex and convoluted. So uh, I don't blame him for not being able to get that to work properly since it has to go through that other software. Uh, but that is a negative that you should be aware of. Load times. Uh, load times on this thing, generally pretty good. That's kind of the best way I can put it because with the GDMU, it's limited to only SD cards and it's limited to only certain SD cards at certain sizes and of certain uh, production, meaning like SanDisk and like there's a couple brands that work, you know? Uh, and so therefore there's really not much variation in the load time speeds. It is universally agreed that the load times off of there are better than they are off of a disc. That makes sense. Um, with this thing, because you can stick in just about anything USB based, it's going to depend entirely on the quality of your flash drive or your hard drive, etc. And uh, as a result, these speeds can vary. So the only thing I can say is in general, they run just fine. In general, they run better than they would off of a disk. But you know, like the nicer your flash drive or the nicer your hard drive, the better it's going to work. But with that in mind, this is a USB 2.0 device. Don't bother getting 3.0 devices for it because they are technically compatible, but they really won't take advantage of the fact that they have 3.0 uh, functionality. And in fact, there can be negatives to that. Um, 2.0 devices seem to have no, no issues booting games, but a lot of people have reported that 3.0 devices, they generally work, but every once in a while they just don't. And if you do want to buy one of these, that's where it starts to get a little difficult. Um, Stone Age Gamer used to sell these, no longer does. Uh, so I think the only place you can get them is from the guy who actually makes them. Again, the link is in the description. And uh, But, well, I didn't order from him, obviously, because Chip gave it to me. But um, I've heard some mixed stories about that. Like, the guy's in Russia, and he makes them himself. So it's kind of like he makes them when he has the time, and he ships them when he has the time. Uh, so some people say that they get theirs right away, and other people say they wait months before it shows up. So that's on you if you want to go through that. But uh, yeah, overall, I uh, hope this review was helpful to you guys. Uh, so if you want to check one out, go for it. Um, thank you very much for watching. Thank you again, Chip, and see you guys later.